Romans 10, 9, it says, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Good evening. Welcome to One Man's Faith. My name is Neil Owen. Glad to be with you tonight. And let's just uh, let's just reason together, look at God's Word, and um, and discuss some interesting things. Tonight, as usual, let's start with a psalm. So we'll go to Psalm 26, since this is the 26th day of the month. And it reads, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart. For thy loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I do not sit with deceitful men, nor do I go with pretenders. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I shall wash my hands in innocence, and I will go about thine altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare all thy wonders. O Lord, I love the habitation of thy house and the place where thy glory dwells. Do not take my soul along with the sinners, nor my life with men of bloodshed, and whose hands is a, is a wicked scheme and whose right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on a level place. In the congregations I will bless the Lord. A great psalm of David. Listen to what he won't do. He won't sit with deceitful men. He won't pretend. He hates evildoers, and so he will not sit with the wicked. He shall wash his hands in innocence, and he will go about thine altar. You know, there's a, there's a vast difference between what a Christian is and what an unbeliever is. A Christian doesn't walk in wickedness. Now, you may be sitting out there and you're not a Christian and saying, yeah, right, yeah, I've seen some of these Christians and I know, I know how they walk. Well, you know, in some cases, that's unfortunate because being a Christian doesn't make you perfect. It just puts you in a place where you can be forgiven. Now, yes, if you're not a Christian, you can be, but you have to first go through the process of accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So a Christian has gotten one step beyond that. However, the Bible does tell us that if we're going to be Christians, we're going to follow God's ways. And if we follow God's ways, then we're not going to be doing some of the things that you feel like we shouldn't be doing. And it also depends on what you saw or experienced as to whether it falls into this category of being wicked. Because we all see with glasses that are different based on the gifting God has given us. And even if you're not a Christian, God has endowed you with a gift. It's called your motivation, your motivational gift. And that will affect how you work and how you see things. So... David says that he will not sit with deceitful men, nor will he sit with wickedness. That is something that we as Christians really need to be careful about. Because deceitfulness can be not a purposeful thing, but something that kind of falls in our laps and we, we help it to pervade. Uh, for an example, a rumor. There are many times you will hear things, but do you know for a fact that it's true? Or are you saying, well, it was a reliable source? Well, if it was even a reliable source can spread a rumor. And lying lips Proverbs 12 tells us, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. And if you're spreading a rumor, then that's lying lips, and they are an abomination to the Lord. And so as Christians, we need to be careful with that. Matter of fact, Colossians tells us, let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth. And by spreading 
or passing on a rumor, something a rumor now is something that you know nothing about. You've had no experience. You're hearing it from somebody else, and you're proclaiming it as true. And they hurt people. A lady came to me the other day at church and said, Neil, did so-and-so steal money from the church? And did they end up in jail? And I said, it's a lie. No, he did not steal money from the church. And I know he's not in jail because I saw him yesterday. You see what happens there? Now, if, you know, thank goodness she was coming. She, and, and what she had told me was that, that she had heard from other people what I just said to you. And so I told her, I says, no, it's a lie. It did not happen. But yet, if she hadn't come to me and taken it in, because it was a reliable source, then she would have been hurt within by the rumor to the, to the point of having bad feelings about a person based totally on a rumor. And you know, that goes around a lot. You know, I'm hearing rumors about New Hope closing. Totally false. It is a lie. It's not happening. It is not happening. So we need to be careful and if someone tells you something, then you need to find out by going to the source or totally rejecting him and saying, don't talk to me about it. Unless you know for a fact, unless you saw it, then you're spreading a rumor. Please don't, t please don't do that anymore. We as Christians need even to other Christians put a stop on that. And so I want to encourage you. Be like David. Trust in the Lord. Vindicate me, O me, vindicate me, O Lord, for I am walking in my integrity. See, if you walk with integrity, you won't do that. I don't care who tells it to you. You see, even, even for us, when something happens to us, because of our motivation, how we see the world is based on that. And I've talked about this before. And so... Even if something happens to me, when I come and tell you about what happened to me, and if I do that, it's going to be more out of hurt than anything else. And I'm offended. And so I will tell you, and I will skew it towards me. We all do this. And by doing that, whether we, no matter how big or small, it becomes a lie. And so we need to be careful. There's no need to tell people about something that's happened to you that someone else has done to you. Unless it's, unless it's to seek counsel, but we need to be careful that. I had a lady come to me last year and said, you know, I'm just telling you this because you need to know because you're the pastor. And she told me these things. And in it, she said, you know, and I, you know, I'm telling you, even though I promise not to tell anybody, What's the problem right there? But they went on to say, but you're the pastor. You need to know. I said, no, I don't need to know. You are breaking a vow. You promised not to tell anybody. And now you're telling me. But you're the pastor. Doesn't make any difference. So we need to be careful with these things. We need to start walking, as David said, in our integrity. We need to be truthful. We need to be honest. We need to be fair. And by doing these things that I have described, we end up hurting other people and hurting their reputations and hurting their chances to proclaim the gospel to people. So David said, I love the inhabitation of your house. And the place where your glory dwells, O oh Lord. My foot will stand on a level place, and in the congregations 
I will bless the Lord. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word that is good for edification for the need of the moment. Let's make our word wholesome. Let's carry it forth. And let's quit. Matter of fact, if you if people have said same thing, if people have said things to you and you have said it to others, then let's repent right now. And let's get rid of that. And so, Father God, we come before you, Lord, and we just ask, Lord, that you would just touch our lips with your coal and make our words pure. Father, help us to walk in our integrity. Forgive us, Lord, for, for passing on rumors and saying things that even though were presented to us as truth, we're false. And Lord, we ask for your forgiveness for that. Walk with us, Father. Help us to walk in a manner that is worthy of you. And we love you, Father, and we praise you. Lord, just, I just pray you would go out tonight over the air, that you would just touch lives that people would come to know you and that your name would be lifted up. And so we thank you, Father. We thank you for your goodness and we give you the honor and the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God's good. God's good. It's wonderful that we can come to him at any time. And if we ask for forgiveness, he will forgive us. That's who God is. God is love. And love holds no record of wrong. And so when we ask for forgiveness, he forgives us. It's great. It's great. So let me um, give you a little word of uh, advertisement. Uh, this weekend at New Hope Fellowship, we are having Harold Eberly. And I want to invite you to come. He'll be there Saturday morning and Saturday evening. Saturday, uh, excuse me, Sunday morning and Sunday evening. He'll be there for our worship service Sunday morning at 930 and then we'll gather again at 6 for an evening service. And then he will be with us the following, the next Monday, the, the next night, Monday night at 6 o'clock. So you have the, there are three chances to hear him. And I'd even suggest coming to all three. Harold's a great guy. He, he's, uh, he has World Cast Ministries. He has been to Africa and has started several Bible colleges in Africa. He's written 22 books. Uh, and right now the Lord has him working with the Muslims and he's coming to visit and to share with us. Um, Harold is prophetic and he has a prophetic ministry and he's going to share words of wisdom and talk about being prophetic. So uh, I'd invite you to come. It'd be a great time. We'll, we'll take a love offering for him. Uh, and if you come, I know you will be blessed. I have been blessed every time I've heard this guy. And so I'm really looking forward to this. And so I want to just pass it on to you and say, come. You're invited to come, 9.30 Saturday morning, 6 o'clock Saturday night, and 6 o'clock Monday night, any or all. We'd love to see you there. So with that, let's take a break, and we'll be back in just a minute. Romans 10, 9, says, If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Romans 10, 9, says, If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus I'll be Welcome back to the second part of One Man's Faith. My name is Neil Owen. Glad you're here. Hope you got in a second, second cup of coffee and are ready to start as we jump into the Word of God again. And let's turn to Genesis 11. Genesis 11, and we'll read some verses down through uh, chapter, chapter 12, verse 3 or 4. Um, this is um, an outline about Abram, starting with verse 27. Now, these are the records of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. And Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Verse 30, And Sarah was barren, and she had no children. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, 
his grandson, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, uh, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran and settled there. And the days of Terah were 205, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and, and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. And in all of the families of the earth, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. If you've read any of the Bible to understand any of the stories of the Bible, you understand the story of Abram, uh, who became Abraham and is the predecessor father of the, of the Jewish nation, the Israelites. For out of Abram came Isaac and Jacob, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and he had the 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. So Abraham is the father of the father of the father. Now, I want to look at him because I want to look at what I call the greatness factor. What made Abram great? Why did God pick Abram or Abraham? And I want to look at that and I want to then, you know, I want you to understand that God really wants to use you. He has a plan for you. He has a place and a people for you to go to. It could be your next door neighbors. It doesn't matter. But God wants to use you. And what made Abraham great? And I want to start to look at that. Now, some interesting points at B, before we leave this. Down in verse 20, um, well, it says, Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. He had three sons. We don't know if he had any others, but he had these three. And it says Haran died in the presence of his father in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldees. Now, according to Jewish, the, the Jewish philosophers and sages, by that it means that in the presence of his father, Haran died. Now, there, there is... There, there's a belief in some of the Jewish um, sages that Terah made Nimrod mad. Uh, and so he was going to take it out on Abram. And supposedly, according, according to the Jewish stories, they threw Abram into a fire and he did not die. And so they brought him out. And so they were going to throw uh, Terah in. And Haran said, no, for, go ahead, don't hurt my father, throw me in. Thinking that the same thing would happen to him. And when they threw him in, he died. Uh, all, because, all because he made Nimrod mad. So, you know, we don't know if, you know, if that's what really happened here. Um, but he lost his youngest son. And... Haran had um, two daughters and uh, a young man named Lot, his, his son. Um, and Abram and Nahor, the brothers of Haran, took Haran's daughters, Sarai and Milcah, and married them. That's part of what happens. It's part of what God's law was later. He reveals in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers that 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 if um, if a man dies, his brothers are to carry on the lineage of that um, of that man. Uh, now this is this is before the law, but it it was happening. And what's interesting, it says in uh, verse twenty nine. It says, Abram had Sarai, his wife, 
and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran. Both of them, Sarah and Milcah, were the daughters of, of Haran. And he says that he was the father of Milcah and Iscah. Iscah is another name for Sarah. Uh, why they used it there, we don't know. But uh, Iscah is mentioned in verse 29. Is Sarah previously mentioned in that same verse? So, let's do a little bit of background because I, I want you to see and understand this. It's interesting to note that from Adam to the flood was 1,656 years, okay? Ten generations, 1,656 years, okay? After the flood, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. After the flood, Shem had a son two years after the flood. And from, from Arpachsad to Abram was 292 years. Okay? So from the flood to Abram was 296 years, which is basically from Shem to Abram was another 10 generations. All right, through that line. Um, now, it's interesting to note, well, I'll, I'll come back to that later. Shem, Ham, and Japheth are the ones that, that populated the world, okay? Because um, everybody else had died except for the family of Noah. So we had, we had Noah, his wife, um, and his three sons and their wives. And they're the ones that came off the ark and they ended up populating the world. Japheth, it is believed, and um, it gives some indication that Japheth went north from uh, Mount Arat and, uh, and that area, because that's where they landed and probably settled for a while. Japheth went north, populating up through Turkey, Greece, and into Europe. Ham went south into Egypt. And Africa. And so Abram, I mean Ham, populated Africa. Ham is the one who also um, uh, saw his father naked uh, after, after he got drunk, told his two brothers, and they, they scolded him for it and went and covered their father uh, by even backing up so they didn't even look at their father and, ha and they had a, a blanket or, or something and laid it over over Noah, so, so he would be covered. And um, Noah cursed Canaan, Ham's son. Canaan are the Canaanites who populated the area that eventually Israel went back into, okay? So Ham went down, went down the coast and into, um, into Africa and the Africans are Ham's descendants. Shem populated uh, Asia uh, the, and the Middle East area. Okay, so that's kind of how they how they um, broke out. Now, what's interesting to note uh, is this: we a lot of times read what uh, read these genealogies and think. That it went, it went uh, Arpachshad, uh, Shila, Eber, Peleg, Reu, Sigu, Nor, and like maybe Abram knew uh, Nahor, his his great grandfather. Um, but you know, you know that was it. But we got to remember that these people lived a long time. Um, Abram lived 175 years. Okay, now Shem, Shem it says was a hundred when he had Arpachsad. His, he had other sons and daughters but 
but this lineage down to Abram goes through Arpachshad. And it says that he lived 500 years after he had Arpachshad, okay? There are 290 years from Arpachshad to Abram, which means that Shem was only 390 when Abram was born. When Abram died, Shem was only 565 years old. So he lived 35 years after Abraham died. Which also means that Isaac was 110 when Shem lived. Now that's 10 generations. So Abraham and Isaac knew or knew of Shem. And it is believed, and the reason I bring this up is because it is believed that Melchizedek was Shem. Melchizedek is really not a name. Melchizedek is more of a title. It's hard to tell with a lot of these, um, a lot of the nouns and words in the Hebrew if they're titles or names. And so sometimes they come up, they end up being a... Um, a name. The reason I say this is because Melech is the Hebrew word for king. Tzedek is the Hebrew word for righteousness. So Melchizedek is the title king of righteousness, which I believe is brought out in Hebrews, that he was the king of righteousness. He was the king of Salem, which is Jerusalem. And so... Uh, Abraham is met by Melchizedek after he, he um, um, brings Lot back from being captured. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But it's just interesting to think that these people knew each other. Um, and so Abraham knew not only Terah, but when Abraham left to go when God called him, Terah was still alive. Even though in verse um, 32 of chapter 11 it says, In the days of Terah, 205 years, he was still alive when, um, when, when Abram left him. Uh, because he was only 70, I believe, when he had Abram. And he, left, he lived 200 years. So Abram was 175, so he was still alive. I think he died when Abraham was 135. So we, it's, it's, it's interesting to note this, that even though it says Abra, Terah died, he didn't die until after Abraham had left to go to Canaan. And that's important to understand because it said, God said, go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house. Now see, it would have been easier for Abram to go if his dad was dead. But his dad wasn't. His dad was much alive. And actually, Terah was on his way to Canaan. He picked up uh, as a matter of fact, we um, we had we read that um, and Sarah took Abram his son. This is verse thirty-one of chapter eleven. And Lot the son of Haran and his grandson and Sarah's daughter-in-law, his uh, and Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. But they stopped at Haran. And that's where the father settled. And it was at Haran, Terah died. Now, God calls Abraham and says, go. And he leaves. What's interesting and, and what I want you to see is Abraham was given ten tests by God. 
this one being the first. Go forth from your country, from your relatives and from your father's house to a land which I will show you and I will make you a great nation. Okay? His father's still alive. They a lot of times don't leave. The families stay together. And so the first test Abraham had was, are you going to leave and go and follow me and go where I tell you to? Now, there are many that believe that Terah was an idol maker. I have a hard time believing that because how does Abraham know to obey God if he hadn't been taught that? And with that lineage and Shem still being alive, even though Shem lived over in Canaan, he had a great heritage there to know God, to know about God, to know about Noah even, and to leave and to go when God called him. And so the first test, Abraham passes because it said, it says, and so Abraham went forth. He heard God's voice and he left. One point of greatness. We're going to stop right there. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back. Romans 10, 9, it says, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Romans 10, 9, it says, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Welcome back to the third section of One Man's Faith. Again, my name is Neil Owen. Glad you're with me. Hope you got that third cup of coffee now and are ready to go and maybe that piece of pie. Um, and we're talking about Abraham and we're looking at why God picked him, you know. And we've looked now that Abram was 75 uh, when he left to go to Canaan. God said, leave your mom and dad and get out of here. Take your wife and go to Canaan. Uh, to the land I will show you, and, I, and God said, I will make you a great nation. Now, keep in mind also, as we read, Sarah was barren. Sarah couldn't have children. So they left and they went um, to Canaan. Then it says in chapter 12 that there was a great famine. And so Abram went down to Egypt. Now, this was another test. This was test number two. If God called him to go, to Canaan, why did he go to Egypt? I don't think that was the right thing to do. Yes, there was a famine, but why didn't he rely upon God? So this becomes a test really that he fails because he left Canaan and went to Egypt. And secondly, in going into Egypt, if I can say this, it was like Going to Las Vegas, which we, you know, which has been named Sin City. I believe that name's going to change, but for right now, you know, Egypt was like Las Vegas, except it was a whole nation. They were very immoral. And so when they go in, Abram Ham knew this. And says, and he said to Sarah, he said, when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, we will kill him. Kill him. And they will, they will not let me live. Please say that you are my sister so that it may go well with me because of you and that I may live on account of you. So Abraham gets his wife to agree to this lie and claim that... Um, she is his sister, and we know the story. The, the, the Egyptian pharaoh says, ah, a beautiful woman. Now, she's 65 or older, but she's a beautiful woman. Um, and he takes her to be his wife. And God has to deal with uh, pharaoh, causes plagues, causes him to dream and to know that he didn't to touch this woman. And so... This was his third test. Abraham failed. He passed the first one. Now these two, he's failed. And so he leaves. Now, it's believed that 
one of the things that Abraham was given was a maid for Sarah whose name was Hagar and that she was uh, and Pharaoh's, one of Pharaoh's daughters, um, but given, given as a maid to Sarah. This is where, and it's believed that's, that's how they, they, pro, uh, uh, they received Hagar as a maid. It does say a little bit later that she was an Egyptian maid, an Egyptian. So they go on, and uh, Abraham and Lot can't um, stay together. Uh, they have too many uh, cattle and things, and so they're getting each other's way. And so uh, Abraham said, okay, Lot, you, you need to leave. And Lot went toward Sodom and settled. Um, the kings of that area... Um, started to have a battle with some other kings and in this process Lot is captured and taken captive. Uh, and in Genesis uh, 13 um, it says that a fugitive came and told Abram, uh, told Abraham the Jew. Um, when Abram heard that his relative had been taken he led out his men, 318, and went in pursuit. Now, th this is the first time that the term Hebrew is used in verse uh, 13. Then a fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew. The word Hebrew really means a fugitive, not a, fu uh, a foreigner. Uh, and so that's how the term got tagged to Abram. He was in Canaan. He was a foreigner to them. He wasn't, he wasn't a Canaanite. Okay? Uh, but he heard that Lot had been taken, and so he goes after the armies of these five kings with 318 men. And he takes back uh, Lot and the other people that had been taken captive and brings them back. Um, and it says in... Um, chapter 14, that after his return of the king, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley. And Melchizedek, here's the first time we hear of Melchizedek with Abraham, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. Now this is test number five. Test number one, he passed. Two and three, he failed. Four, he passed because he went after his relative. He did not just say, okay, you know, Lot, we didn't work well together, so you're on your own. Lot was his brother's son, and so he went after him, and he captured him back and brought him back. Now, at the same time here, when uh, Melchizedek brought out the bread and wine, which was a, a symbol of, of peace, and, and um, victory is when Abram tithed to Melchizedek, gave him a tenth of what he had. So this was a time when the king said, okay, give me the people, you take the money. And Abraham said, no, I didn't, come, I didn't go after the money. I went after my relative. And so test number five, Wealth and prestige. The king was giving him wealth and prestige, and Abraham said, no, that's not what this is all about. And so, test number five, Abram passes. Test number six, in chapter 16 of Genesis, it says, as we know, it says, now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid, this was Hagar, so Sarah said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to her. Now, guys, I don't want to get all of us in trouble, but we've got to be careful in listening to our wives. Now, think about this. 
if Abraham had come up with this idea and said, Sarah, we don't have any children. How about if I take Hagar and go into her? You know, I think we would have had a Bobbit incident here in the Old Testament if that had happened. That wouldn't have been a good thing if Abraham had come, come up with the idea, but Sarah came up with the idea. Now, what's a guy going to do? Here's a, probably, here's a beautiful maid, and the wife says, go into her. Test number six, Abraham fails. He fails big time because they have a son, and his name is Ishmael. So, Test one, four, and five, they pass. Test two, three, and six, he's, he's 50 50 right now in his pass fail of these, of these 10 tests. What's a guy going to do? What's a guy going to do? How is this affecting Abraham's stand with God? What is happening? Well, let's go on with these tests and, and we'll see. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Romans 10, 9, it says, If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Romans 10, 9, it says, If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved. Welcome back. This is our fourth section of One Man's Faith, the last section. I'm glad you've stuck with me this long. We're looking at the life of Abraham, and we're looking at the ten tests. And we want to, I, want to, I want to see these ten tests and how they affected God's relationship with Abram. Why did he call him? I mean, here's a man so far. He's passed three of the ten. He's failed three. So he's three for three. He went when God said go. He, um, he failed when he went into um, Egypt. He failed with uh, allowing Sarah to be his sister because he was afraid of the Egyptians. <coughs> Excuse me. He passed by going after Lot, his relative, when, his Lot, when, when Lot was taken captive. Um, he... Uh, and he failed, and he failed with Hagar. So he's three for three. Now, test number seven, God says to Abram, he says, now I'm going to make you, I'm going to make you a nation, okay? He says, God further said to Abraham, now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, every male among you, shall be circumcised. Now, Abram is over 90. And God is saying, you and your descendants, as part of the covenant between us, you will be circumcised. Now, to be honest with you, if I'd been Abraham, I think I would have said, but what about Sarah? And she going to have something? God, this is going to be pain. God, I don't want to do this. But he didn't. And so at 90 plus years old, he's, he's circumcised. He descends circumcised. Ishmael is circumcised. And so he passed. When God said it, he did it. So test number seven, now he's four for three. Test number eight, Abraham was sojourning in Gerar, and Ab Abraham went and met Abimelech. And Abraham said to Sarah, this was not, Actually, Abraham didn't say to Sarah, he told Abimelech, he said, <coughs> she's my sister. 
He didn't learn from the first time. She's my sister. He didn't even ask or consult with Sarah. However, Sarah backs him up. And when, he was, and when she was asked, she said, yeah, I'm his sister. They don't learn. Abimelech took her as his wife. But God spoke to Abimelech in a dream and said, Abimelech, you touched that girl and you're dead. And so Abimelech said, wait a minute, I didn't do anything. I didn't know. They told me that they were brother and sister. But God said, Abimelech, you touch her and you're dead. And so test number eight, Abraham fails. Now he's four for four. He's passed four and he's failed four. Something interesting to notice. The ones that he passes are the ones where God said to do something and he did it. The ones that he has failed, except for the battle, that was the only one that God didn't say, go, but he did. But every time God tells him to do something, he does it. He left Haran. He circumcised his, um, uh, he circumcised himself. And then, and then, and then this one. But he failed the one with Abimelech. He failed the one with the famine. He failed the one with going into Egypt and calling Sarah his, um, uh, his sister. And he failed with Hagar. All right. Test number nine. Test number nine was Sarah said to, um, they were having a party for Isaac. Isaac, Isaac is now born. Isaac is at an age where he is weaned off of his mom. And so they have a party. Um, for Isaac, I guess, I guess it was a weaning party. I don't know. Is this a party to the fact that, that Isaac had, had grown beyond that stage? And it says that Sarah saw the son of Hagar, Ishmael, whom she had borne to Abram, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, Drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be an heir to my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abram greatly because of his son. Abraham did not want to drive them out. But Sarah saw something in Ishmael that frightened her. Now, by this time, Ishmael was 13 years old. And so it, it appears that Ishmael has now been influenced a lot by his mother, Hagar, to where there seems to be a disdain toward uh, Isaac from Ishmael. And Sarah was afraid that it... And I believe she, she was probably frightened that, was, that she was afraid it would lead to Ishmael doing something to Isaac. But Abraham's afraid. Ab this, is, this is his son. Even though it was through the Egyptian maid, it's still his son. And so he was distressed. But God said to Abraham, Abraham, listen to your wife and do what she says. And so he sent out Hagar and Ishmael and they got into a little bit of trouble because they ran out of water. God provided for them and said, Ishmael will become a nation. And he, he allowed them to live. But this was one that Abraham passes. Again, God said, do it. And Abraham does it. The last test, the biggie. God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I want you to take your son and I want you to sacrifice him. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you. And Abraham doesn't flinch. Abraham does it. Now you know, you and I, if God had come to us, would we be that obedient? 
But God, my son, God, I cannot, God, I will not do that. But Abraham didn't say that. It says that Abraham took two servants, his son, the wood, and everything. Now, keep in mind, Isaac is probably 20 to 30 years old. So this is not a thing where he's a little boy and Abraham's dragging him up to the mountain forcefully. He's old enough and Abraham is over 100 years old. So there's no way Abraham is going to force Isaac to go. And, but Isaac does it. And so they go to Moriah. Abraham puts him on the altar. And he has bound his son, which he could not do on his own. Abraham had, I mean, Isaac had to let him do it. But they, they accomplish it. And as he was, had the knife up and was ready to bring it down, God stopped him and said, I know you love me. I know you'll do what I ask. There's a ram. Sacrifice the ram. This was the ultimate test, the test that Abraham passed. It's interesting to note that it says that Abraham knew that even if he killed his son, God would raise him from the dead. You see, God had made a promise to Abraham. The promise was that through that son, you would be the father of a multitude of nations. And there's, Abraham knew that if he sacrificed his son, God had to raise him from the dead in order to fulfill the promise he had made. Actually, it was part of a covenant. So it was even stronger than a promise. Abraham knew. You see, we have that same type of promise with God. Anytime God makes a promise, it'll be true. God doesn't break promises. God is faithful. Ten tests. Now, of the ten tests, which is he known for? Hebrews 11 says, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. By faith he lived as an alien. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Of the ten tests, only two are remembered as great tests. Only two. Abraham was a man just like you and me. He had failures, but he obeyed God whenever God called him. And he trusted God and believed what he said. This is what made Abraham great. Not only that, but greatness is not measured by passing and failing and how many. Greatness is measured by the faithfulness of the individual. You want to be great? Obey God. Learn to hear his voice. Learn to step out. When he calls you to do something, do it. Don't hesitate. Don't argue. Don't even fleece him. But Neil, I don't know if it was God then learn to know God's voice when he calls you. Be ready to go. Watch out for failures. Watch out for things that will come in your way that will cause you maybe to veer left or right and not stay on this path. Trust God. When God says something, he means it and he will do it. God loves you. God has something for you. You are special to him because Jesus died for you. Learn to trust your Lord. If you don't know who Jesus is, if you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior, now's a good time to do it. All you have to do is say, Father, I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe you raised him from the dead. I claim him as my Lord and Savior right now. And then you just pray that. And say, Father, forgive me for my sins against Jesus. For the fact that I have not obeyed you, I have not followed you. I have done wrong. 
I have sinned against you. Forgive me. And I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. When you do that, He does that. He forgives you. You become a child of God. You come into the kingdom. And there are many bennies. But God has something for you. He's waiting for you. There are people that only you can touch. There is no plan B. Accept Him. Walk in Him. Learn to be great. Learn to trust Him. Learn to obey Him. You have a great week. God bless you. And we'll see you next time. Romans 10, 9, it says, If I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'll be saved.